It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Bonjour, bienvenue à Take Command. All right, I'm back. I'm back from France. That's Logan. Good. I'm Craig. Aujourd'hui, j'ai vu des news. Logan, I, I gotta say, uh, watching watching French Olympic coverage. As I as I sit here, I'm not gonna wear this hat for the entire podcast because that. That would be even a step too far for me as I'm wearing my Paris 2024 bucket hat. Um, watching, though, some of the Olympic coverage in the French coverage and Steph Curry and, and such as we watch the basketball um, was, was quite entertaining. Uh, it was a hell of a trip. Uh, I'll talk about it more on the radio show. But today we're going to talk about the weekend that the Washington Commanders had against the New York Jets, uh, both the joint practice and uh, more importantly, uh, at least for this conversation, the preseason game because Logan and I both got to watch it. Although, Logan, I'm going to take the hat off now. Uh, we have very different experiences watching this game. I watched it uh, on an airplane in very blurry Wi-Fi uh, on demand on the NFL's uh, app. Thank you, Game Pass. You you were on the sidelines. I, I actually saw you at one point in your own bucket hat yeah. uh, with the uh, with the headset on. I, I, I do think the headset over the bucket hat is probably the better play, as I just learned. Um, <laughs> something that means nothing to the podcast audience, but everything to you. I was wearing a bucket hat is the point at the start of this podcast. Uh, but ultimately, I've got a chance to watch it back. And um, interesting game. Lots to talk about. Uh, anything big picture that you take away kind of from the weekend? Um, versus, you know, anything specific that we'll get into, but just any big picture takeaways from uh, what we know of the joint practices and, and then ultimately uh, what we saw in the game on Saturday. I think the biggest picture takeaway is that, like, it sounds like based on just the reports out of uh, joint practice, because I wasn't able to go, but, you know, I talked to a bunch of people on the beat, talked to some people I know up there. It sounds like, you know, there was some really positive things, specifically on 7-on-7 seven seven that the commanders did, but, you know, obviously when the offensive line and it was a team setting and the – the Jets had their first defensive group out there. It was a little bit of a tough sled, you know, because the protection becomes an issue. Um, some of the concepts are longer developing against, you know, Sauce Gardner. That's a little bit more challenging. So it sounds like there's a general talent deficiency at the moment, but I think that's kind of to be expected, especially given kind of this this rash of injuries with the offensive linemen at the moment. You know, Wiley, uh, Brandon Coleman, uh, Cornelius Lucas is missing, um, you know, for personal reasons. But I think uh, – those guys are guys you're expecting to play a lot for you. And so, you know, when you're practicing with Chris Paul at tackle and Mason Brooks at tackle, guys that are better suited to guard, like that's what's going to happen. You know what I mean? I think the other thing that came out of the weekend and, you know, just I think it kind of revealed itself in the game too is that um, it sounded like the front seven did a really good job in the joint practices, just creating pressure, um, which insulates, I think, some of the coverage stuff in the back end. You see that a little bit, obviously, uh, in the game, like how a good rush – helps out with the coverages a little bit better. And I think offensively you see how a good um, play caller can insulate an offensive line. Because like, you know, for as much maligned as Chris Paul and Mason Brooks were at tackle during practice, I don't think, we, you know, I don't think Chris Paul gave up a pressure in the game. So uh, right. lots of good things to kind of generally take away. But I think the highest level thought, this is still a rebuilding or a retooling team um, with good energy, uh, some pieces to build around. But there's still a little ways to go to kind of play with uh, the big boys, it sounds like, from a talent perspective. And again, it's, you know, it's the first joint practice preseason week one. Still a lot of time to develop there for sure. Yeah, I um, I was very offline in terms of everything that happened over the last week. And then, uh, you know, kind of got back on, listened to a couple of podcasts, listened to John's shout out to, to the John Kime Report. John Kime Report. Um, you know, and, and took in some other things, uh, on the flight back to prepare for, for getting going again. And I do think that is something that, you know, we have to keep in mind is like, I mean, Sam Howell looked pretty good in, in parts of the preseason last year. And, you know, we saw some things in the Baltimore joint practice where we're like, oh, that's, that was great. But we ignore oh, this other thing, like, ah, we'll just mark it up to whatever X, Y, Z. And then all of a sudden those things that we kind of washed over with burgundy colored glasses wound up being big things during the regular season. So I don't want to make that mistake again. Um, but I do think to your point, the bigger like issue I think is just like, is, are these guys going to be ready for the season? Like, is yeah. there a, a talent gap? And, and also the, I think one of the interesting things that ties the game and the practices together to kind of get us started on the game here is what does it say about the depth of tackle that they thought their best option to protect the second overall pick to start this game was, putting Chris Paul out there at right yeah. tackle. 
like Chris where Paul and Trent Scott, yeah. yeah, and Trent Scott, and like okay, Trent's Trent's tackle four, like that makes sense, but like where's the rest of it? And I guess to a point, you're going well. There's only so many dudes you can have on a right. roster. Nobody, nobody in the NFL is good seven tackles deep or five tackles yeah. deep. But I thought that was very interesting from a decision making standpoint to go. I think our best bet is not actually to figure out, you know, Alex Akambulu, is he even still around? He get cut last week. I think he was um, hurt. Yeah, I got hurt. Cut? Yeah, I don't know. So yeah. whoever whoever would have been next up. Um, you know, a tackle to be like, no, our best bet is is Chris Paul. Our best bet is Mason Brooks. And I think that's interesting from a decision-making standpoint in a roster and also makes you wonder, like, okay, uh, whether it's David Bakhtiari or, or whoever else is still floating out there, there aren't a lot of names. And that's, that's a hard part. I know John talked about that on his show. Like, I think one of the more intriguing guys is like a DJ Humphreys long-term, but like he's coming off injury. He's not ready yet. Right. Um, John mentioned Charles Leno, which I don't know that that name is going to get anyone excited around here considering the up and down season Charles had last year. But even if, if Charles wanted to play him, they wanted him back. He's not available. Um, he's, he's coming off a hip injury. So um, there, there just isn't a lot of like good tackles. Don't grow on trees. They're not available out there. Um, if they were available, then they, you know, or if they were good, they would be signed somewhere because this is not the only team that that's shallow a tackle. And so that does become an issue if this whatever tightness Andrew Wiley's experiencing doesn't release itself and all of a sudden he's ready to go and get the reps and be not just good ready to play physically, but like prepared to play and play well in the regular season. They don't have a chance to get all of a sudden Brandon Coleman ready for left tackle like they wanted to. Like that presents real challenges if you have to play Cornelius Lucas at limiting to your offense. And we see the the use of the screen game, not just with the first team, but all throughout this game from Cliff Kingsbury. And like that you can't do to the left side with Cornelius Lucas. He just doesn't move well enough. And so there's there's limitations to your offense and and from a personnel standpoint that present themselves beyond like, hey, by the way, you also faced a really, really good NFL defense and you kind of got your butt kicked for an entire practice. Not that the Jets wouldn't do that to a lot of people, but um, it kind of does. It is a reminder of the stakes here. And while there's so much good energy and so much good work being done, that reality of the talent deficiency in year zero or year one, however you want to call it, of a rebuild is still a reality that this team's going to face multiple times this year. Yeah, and again, that's not a that's a not a bad thing. This is part of the process. Like they've done a good job, kind of handling this off season. And like you said, like it's just hard to find good tackles. And I think like the fact we're even having a conversation after you know nine, ten practices, counting the joint practice, that Brandon Coleman could be your starting left tackle. I think is a testament to the staff. So if you get you know your starting left tackle, starting quarterback, year one of the rebuild, like you're doing okay. They're both on rookie Heck deals. Yeah. You're doing okay. So. Um, I think it just was a little disappointing because like just uh, just from an evaluation standpoint, like Brandon Coleman's done a good job. I think he's definitely going to be special is maybe the wrong word, but I think he has the ability to do something to make waves at the position in a good way just for this team. So it just would have been nice to be able to get him against some of those really good edge rushers up in New York. Some of the guys that were, you know, your Jermaine Johnson's, your Will McDonald's, your your kind of pass rush specialists that they have there. And to, and to miss out on that day, I think that's more the frustration. I don't think it's, it's just to kind of see where he's at. Because right. I think much like Jaden Daniels, you're, you're kind of, you're excited about what he's doing and the process he's showing, but also like you want to see him against other teams. And so Brandon Coleman, I think if I was going to rate it, I said this on our last podcast with Denton, but like he's a little bit behind, so to speak, you know, like he, his potential is there. He could be a starter, but in terms of development, you're not quite as confident as you are with Jaden, for example. So the more evaluation points you get with a guy like him, the better. So it, you, you miss that on it. Um, and again, like that, that's the thing I, I, I'm most frustrated. It's not that they didn't win the day or that their talent isn't where it thought. It's not like it's just you miss kind of knowing where. And I think that they probably are frustrated, too. They miss knowing, uh, you know, where they are at the tackle spot and for whether sure. they need to go out and make one of these moves. I also am not the type of person that's going to crush them for being, you know, where they are from a roster talent standpoint, because they like they brought in 30 new guys. You yeah. can't bring in 52 new guys year one or 53 year guys. Uh, 52 is probably better. Of course, they're keeping trust way. Um, but 53 guys, you know, year one, you're not getting, and there's no need to. Like, you you brought in a ton of new talent. And in a multi-year project, you're just not going to get to everything. And I realize that there is a more specific criticism of, well, if you brought in the quarterback, you have to protect them. But the problem is, is you can't bring in multiple premium positions. Like, there's just not, premium guys don't become available as free agents. 
And if they do, you're going to have to pay the kind of money that this team doesn't want to dedicate at this point in their rebuild. And I don't think there was a premium left tackle on the market anyway. Right. And if you use the number two pick on quarterback, then it's really hard to then go find a left tackle uh, because you've used your first round pick and that's where left tackles come from typically is the first round. And if Coleman winds up working out as a third rounder, that is like an all-time value type of steal because typically the best left tackles in this league are not just first round picks they're like top 10 top five picks like that's what yeah. that's what trent williams is for instance and so uh chris samuels you know, just look at the history of this franchise and so I, I i understand the score here when it comes to that i think the, the more immediate and again this is not a criticism it's just an observation the more immediate concern is like the health of these guys and how quickly they get back wiley's kind of been day to day for a bunch of days um mm. you know i i think the the terming is day to day or week to week on brandon coleman which is a little scarier um so we'll see how quickly he can get back and it sounds like with a week to week prognosis he would miss the miami joints which really sucks because um, they've got a bunch of good rushers down there as well um it's some interesting like speed guys uh that that you know including a rookie and chop robinson that would have been fun to see him match up against um but ultimately i think that what we see in the game is is encouraging on the offensive side from the play calling understanding standpoint. And that that is one of my big takeaways. We'll talk about Jaden specifically in a second. And, and obviously the the one big play that he makes that everyone's going goo goo about as they should. And some of the, the funny kind of circumstances around it, him checking into it and and Dan's comments afterwards. But I, one of the, the notes that I wrote down, Logan, was about Cliff and, you know, the the willingness to get vertical on third down. But it all happens kind of in a timing and a rhythm, the screen game, you know, the running stuff. Like that was a very well managed game by an offensive coordinator who both I think wants to play that way, but also understands that he's got to manage his quarterback situation with an offensive line that is not ready to drop back a bunch of times. And that is refreshing and good. Yeah. And I think you see kind of how that works, you know, and, and what I mean by that, it's like, you know, last year I think we saw, you know, kind of the the other extreme with Eric Bienemy. And again, there's there are you know, precedence for that being done. Obviously, that didn't work here. But, you know, throwing the ball a ton, getting them out of stuff, like throw to run the ball. But I do think you saw, like, how you can call a game very conservatively and still move the ball effectively if you are if you can manufacture one explosive play here and there. And I think that's what you saw in the game yesterday. Like, that is a tenable offense, right? But when that moment comes and the quarterback has the ability to check that play um, – and again, like whether he had the ability in this game or not, but to kind of manufacture that that opportunity is, is pretty cool. So I don't know I, the other thing I want to do here too is just like Cliff did a great job. Again, he didn't do a lot of game planning. You could tell very simple kind of day one, excuse me, base install type stuff. So nothing too crazy, but you see kind of just as a play caller the rhythm that it allows you to get into when when you're being efficient. So credit to the runners, credit to the offensive line early on in this game, um, and also just. Uh, I don't. I want people to be excited about Jaden, obviously, but I also just want to like just pump the brakes a little bit on the performance. You know, he threw a screen that he missed. He threw another screen, and then he threw a fifty-yard bomb to Diami. That's basically a fifty-fifty right. ball, and Diami makes a great play. And I, under, and I understand like that's exciting, and that's what you want to see, and that's a big play. And then he rushes for a touchdown, but he only played eleven snaps, and you know there wasn't like a whole lot to draw from there. And hopefully, in the second outing, there's more to kind of observe. But I think like. For people who haven't seen him at practice, you get to see glimpses of stuff that we've seen in practice that makes him special, you know. And I think you see that in the joint practice too. Seven on seven went really well for him, you know, because he understands how to layer the ball, understands how to do all this different stuff. He understands how to, has a, how, understands how to check into the right play. But um, I think it's just like it's good as a fan base just to kind of take a deep breath and be like, this is a very small sample size. It's a good first step, but there's still many steps that need to go. And in conjunction with that, good job, Cliff, because again, like Chris Paul played a lot of snaps at right tackle for this team in this game. And you didn't even notice. And I give a lot of credit to the play caller when, when that happens, especially in the second half of this game where you get kind of a pat, patchwork bunch of guys. And I guess also you got to give crush, uh, pre, uh, credit to Brian Johnson too. I think those guys were well prepared, especially that first group. They looked really sharp. So good kudos to him. Yeah, no, for sure. I think the the other part that I liked from Cliff uh, from a play calling standpoint, and especially to kind of protect the offensive line, one thing that can make a defense really hesitant and simplifies a lot of stuff is a quarterback run game. And obviously the touchdown to Jaden, um, you know, Dan said afterwards, like you have the freedom to run if no one is there. And so he did pull it and, and was able to, to waltz into the end zone fairly easily. But with Driscoll, um, especially mm -hmm. who played a ton of snaps and Hartman, uh, who played a ton of snaps, like those guys ran it. And we know that's going to be a part of this offense. And so I think 
Cliff showing some of the abilities to generate explosives because some of those runs were, were explosive. So, you know, 15 yeah. plus yard run, you know, you get out on the edge and I think you have to give uh Senate and Cole Turner and, and the tight ends who were Bates, out there blocking yeah. Bates. Like he Cliff did a good job, not just of, of setting up the quarterbacks and generating some explosives, but like, let's set up our tight ends to block DBs. Like, let's yeah. not have our, like there were times, yeah, there was a one running play that I remember that got blown up because John got beat by a defensive end because that's a hard block, as you well know. That wasn't um, even like really, I mean, this is like technical inline blocking stuff. That wasn't even really like his fault, but we can talk about that Yeah, later. it was just like he got bad, he put in a bad spot. Uh, we can talk about the technicality of it later if we want to. But like the, on some of the good plays, he's out there in space on a corner. And like John Bates or Ben Sinnott on a corner having to seal an edge that's a that's advantage commanders and so mm. cliff's ability to to use personnel and matchups and formations and you know the skill sets of his players to to generate explosives in the run game and to add another thing that defenses have to worry about and the fact that this is still pretty much basic day one stuff this is even tricked up at all yet i think is is encouraging i, I come out offensively we'll talk about some of the players specifically in a second but about the offense in general, especially given the circumstances. Like, I actually came out of this game pretty encouraged. Yeah, and again, there's nothing, like, schematically that you're like, wow, you know, but I think yeah. there's just a a good feel for how to call a game, you know, how yeah. to un- understanding your limitation and how to maximize certain positions. And I think that's something that we're hoping to see. And again, it's much like Jaden. It's, like, the first step, but it is a step in the right direction compared to what we've seen over the last couple of years. And so... Hopefully that continues and hopefully that, you know, I'm really excited to watch this this second game and hopefully we see more in and more of a game plan perspective and against a better defensive secondary, in my opinion. Like uh, the, the the better people will be playing, I guess, against Miami. They're not going to sit them, hopefully. And so I'm really excited to see that because I think, like you said, like he did a lot of stuff. Even the thing with Sam Hartman down in the low red where it's like they brought that double A look and Sam checked to the speed option like – I know it's the preseason and the Jets probably don't have a ton of answers for that, like up in the game at this moment, but it's just good process, right? If you get this look, like, why are we going to mess with trying to get the protection called correctly? Let's check to a run, get to the perimeter. It's man to man coverage. The receivers are just running off and we have an opportunity for, I think that was an eight yard, 10 yard run, something like that for almost a touchdown. So yeah. I just, and again, like to see the, the flexibility the quarterback has in the offense and the ownership they have of it, it's, it's cool. And so again, like it's, there's a long way to go. I'm not trying to make any declarative statements just yet, but I agree with you. There were some good, good feel as a play caller, good designs as a play caller, good flexibility in the offense. Lots of things to be excited about. For sure. And, and I think the fact that that's core to who they are is what gets me excited is like, yeah. this is day one stuff for them. Like it, core right. to who we are is right. that we're going to get into the right looks and make things easy, which has kind of always been what players have said about cliff is like he makes offense easier for us he gets guys good matchups he makes reads easy for the quarterback and you see that uh day one speaking of Jaden daniels the big play let's talk about it um apparently he wasn't supposed to do that Right. Uh, which is which is kind of funny, and and as Dan Quinn said afterwards, he Jaden uh, was in a position where he's like, I would rather ask for forgiveness than permission. Uh, and it's a, clearly a part of what they've been taught. It's not like he totally freelance. Like he he did something that is in systematically, but wasn't supposed to be in for that situation. Is kind of the way I take that look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you take out of of what Jaden did there, and um, you know, his ability to to generate a big play on something that he did incredibly well in college, which is throw the ball deep outside the numbers and drop a ball in a bucket to a really fast dude. Yeah. I mean, I think it was cool to talk to Sam Cosme about it, you know, cause like when you're watching on the sideline, you have this really good, good access. You're like, I think he checked that. And you know, like one of the things they had talked about, you know, like the, the, the rumor was that he wasn't supposed to check anything, right? Like he was going to play straight up. We're running screens. We're not doing anything super crazy. Right. And, uh, and I was like, Oh, I guess they, you know, they, they let him do it. And Sam was like, oh, yeah, he checked it. We had, a, we had a screen called, and it's man coverage, and those screens aren't great versus that look. And so he identified. So that gets me juiced. That gets me excited. Having played with guys who are really high-level people who understand coverage, you know, coaching quarterback at the high school level has given me a totally new perspective. Like, that's what you're always hungering for is that guy that just – gets it because if the guy gets it he can get you in the right look and get you in the right play he knows how to execute certain concepts versus different coverage it's going to hit a little bit different the timing is going to be different and so again it's throwing a deep ball in and of itself wow you know that's that's whatever like a lot of people can do that and if he missed it but the process of it 
hey, it's man coverage. I don't like this play versus this. I like this play versus this. I like this matchup. And the other thing I loved about it is he knew the coverage well enough to kind of like be like, hey, I'm not looking right to my matchup. My eyes stay down the field. He got the safety to that side to open the wrong direction and then is able to kind of ensure the one-on-one. So the the process is the thing that gets me excited. It's not the throw. It's not, I mean, that's great, but it's, I understand the coverage. I understand the play that I want. I understand how to maximize that matchup. Check, 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 check. And so that's why that gets me excited. I understand, you know, Dan being frustrated because it sounds like they told him based on his post game comments to kind of like be conservative here. But I also think like there's probably a part of you if you're Cliff and Dan and, you know, Tavita and all the, the guys involved, Brian Johnson, you're probably like, that's pretty sick. Like, good for you. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like it's, oh, it's Dan kinda... was laughing mad. Like, yeah. he was like, well, well, what are you going to do? Like, there was definitely one of those. And, you know, he made a, the, the Top Gun reference. And, I love like, that it was, reference. Yeah, it, it's pretty funny. And, you know, I, I think it's great because, again, it goes back to the point we were just making of, like, this is core to who they are. Like, yeah. I don't know. Hey, coach, you told me that if the play sucks, get in a good one. And so I did. Yeah. Okay, okay. You know what? And, and, like, it's so jaded, too. You think of the Hard Knocks clip that we played. Uh, yeah. Brian Dable's like, what, well, what do you do here against cover Throw one? A Throw a touchdown. And it's like, what do you do here against this look? throw the fade ball to the outside yeah. of the, the the matchup I like. And yeah. like you said, you know, it's it's pretty easy if you go back and you watch the L22 of it. Like you can see it's man coverage. You know, the 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 um oh my God, who did they play? My brain is the not Jets. jet lag. <clears throat> the hilarious I can't remember Jets or jet lag. Um the Jets, uh, you know, they're they're kind of in this kind of too high shell, but it's very easy to see right through it based off the alignments of all the dudes over, oh. you know, man to man. And on that side, like the corners are pressed up and he knows like, okay, if I can just hold this safety, I ensure that man to man. And I know that De'Ami Brown's going to give me a chance. And I also think we should talk about De'Ami on that play because he does a tremendous job of holding the line. If you've ever been out to a practice field uh, or most practices in the NFL, I actually don't know if they have this on the, on the current field. They do. Um, The red line is still out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but they have a red line that's painted off off the you know parallel to the sideline, and the idea yeah. is on a go ball, a receiver is supposed to hold that to give a little bit of extra space for the quarterback or enough space for the quarterback to have space between where you are and the sideline to drop the ball away from the DB. And Diami does a tremendous job of getting on top of the corner by just enough, fighting off the hand contact, and Jaden drops the ball right where it needs to be, and he holds that red line, uh, not out there on an actual NFL field during yeah. during a game, but he holds it, and and I think Jaden's comments afterwards are great where he's like that gave me confidence Diami, but it also just gave Diami confidence and you see him make a great play later mm. with Driscoll out there and and for a guy in Diami that we've been waiting on and waiting on and waiting on this does not ensure that all of a sudden he's going to be actually a really huge receiver for them this year um you know I think at this point it's pretty clear he's making a team um he's had a good camp and, and all that but you know that that Jaden is out there like let me pick my matchup I want two like good for Diami. Yeah. Yeah. And again, formationally, it kind of lends itself to that too. He's right. the kind of yep. the single receiver to the right side. Like it helps with that stuff, but I, I, I like it. And again, it's, I'm sure there's, but it kind of reminds me of that old uh, Bill, uh, Bill Parcells, Tony Romo story, you know, like when they like locked him in a cupboard and basically tried to pressure him into taking a bad deal. And he was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait and make sure I get the deal that I want. Kind of reminds me of that a little bit. It's like you, you're mad, but in some ways I'm sure you're happy too, because it's like, yeah like he wants to win he wants to make plays he wants to do this stuff he understands it like a little cheeky little cheeky i get it but um i was excited i was excited he's also good enough to pull it off and like yeah. that's the point too right yeah. it's like yeah okay and, and yeah again, it's, it's one but, throw it's one throw yeah. but it's 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 the, the the stuff around it was cool and then obviously from to score that touchdown you know on the uh, on the zone read uh great blocking by bates and uh, i think it was cole turner on that play but you know yeah. like great job getting to the perimeter and you know, understanding like that you had it because it's man, it's easy again, easy to see. But like when you get those guys covered up, you're one on one with the safety and like knowing I am a good enough athlete to beat this guy if these blocks are good. Like there's also an understanding there. So, yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Other players that we wanted to highlight slash talk about the running back situation. We thought, uh, you know, B-Rob and Eckler did a really good job. Um, and, but then you get down to, to Wiley, you get down to Chris Rodriguez. What'd you make of the running game as this game went on, starting with those starters and then moving through to the, the backup guys, uh, including how the O-line played in front of them? Yeah, I think it just shows how special B Rob is and how special Austin Eckler is, quite frankly. Like, you know, I think that high ankle sprain, there was a lot of people, myself included, that were a little bit um, unsure of what he'd bring this year. 
Uh, but you see the one cut ability, you see the power, you see the contact balance, all the stuff that made him great with the Chargers. You see kind of on display now, which is awesome and makes me really excited for his role moving forward. Like, man, having a guy that can run like that and can, and be dangerous after the catch is going to be special. But I got to give a lot of props to B Rob, like, and also a lot of props to Cliff. Props to the run game coordinator because it is day one stuff. But again, like there is this good feel for like, hey, like we're going to run an outside zone. We're going to run a mid zone. We're going to run a pin pull. We're going to run a gap scheme. We're going to run a duo. We're going to, you know what I'm saying? And it was just like in the same way that you see with like Kyle and Sean, they kind of understand that like one of the advantages you have as a calling runs is that the defense, it kind of looks the same at the beginning. So kind of just throwing some different stuff out there. And um, I think guys did a good job getting where they had to be. I think you got to credit a lot to that interior group, you know, the Cosme. Biotish, I was really impressed with how to utilize him. Um, in my notes, I remember writing down a couple times, like they did some like pin pull stuff on like mid zone, which is stuff that you see. Kind of, uh, I think the most famous examples are probably in um, Philly. But also New York used it quite a bit last year, where like where the angle's a little bit weird to the linebacker. So you block down, the linebacker holds because he thinks it's a gap scheme run. You pull around and his mobility I thought was great. I thought his mastery of the runs and getting them targeted. Like I think a lot of people like when he like in Dallas, for example, when I watched this film when he was a free agency, free agent, free agent coming in, I was kinda like Man, like, you know, I don't see this great athlete. And usually with center, you you want someone who's smart, who's a great athlete. And I think he wasn't like, you know, Jason Kelsey, but like you saw good movement skills. There was a a tight zone to the right and just the ability to punch through the backside uh, shade and take a really good angle to the next level and cover that guy up. It's it's good stuff. So I was really impressed with that. I thought Allegretti did a good job. I think you see some of his athletic limitations, but you also see, you also see his tremendous power. And again, those three guys inside, I was just really impressed with their ability to move stuff. And then when they're moving stuff and you get B-Rob going downhill with his shoulder square, like he's getting four. And the way B-Rob finished runs, the contact balance, couple that with Austin Eckler, those guys did a great job. And then um, you kind of move on to that next group of guys. And I think uh, it was McNichols and then Chris Rodriguez. And McNichols gets banged up a little bit. Um, so Rodriguez is in. And I, I kind of honestly, I think I said this to you on the phone, I felt bad for Chris Rodriguez a little bit. Yeah. Like he just did not have a good runway on any, on any of his runs. I think he had six runs, seven runs, if I remember correctly. And it just was like unblocked three technique in the front side A gap, right? Where, where there's a there's a line stunt and the guys who, you know, the kind of backup interior didn't get it picked up. And there's a looping defensive lineman getting you. There's a pressure to the front side and I'm running on an unblocked will linebacker. You know what I'm saying? It just was it just was intense for him. And I felt bad because, I, you know, he's a guy that I think shows up with when the pads come on. And never really had the runway to get that done. I think a good juxtaposition actually is like um, Bra- Braden Allen, Brandon Allen, the guy for the Jets, the running back. Yeah, um, it's Allen. He wears zero. I can't remember yeah. his first name. Um, but, you know, he's a big dude. And everyone's like, man, he looked great. But he had a really clean runway to get going, get his shoulder square. And I think Chris Rodriguez is kind of the same way. And so when he doesn't have that runway, that one cut, it gets messy for him. So, so, so I felt bad. And then you compare him to Wiley who I think had some messy runs too, but a little bit cleaner overall, he looks much more productive. And and you see some of the things that make him special, right? The kind of the suddenness, the burst, the ability to catch the football. And you kind of say, maybe maybe he's making a push for the for, for that kind of that, I don't know, third, fourth running back spot, depending on how McNichols looks. So I think that's something that um, I came out of the game like, because I like Chris a lot. He's a good guy, works hard. A lot, of, a lot of respect for how he approaches the NFL game. Um, you know, being a guy that you know is kind of, I don't know. I just, I just, I empathize with him a little bit, and I, I was disappointed in the looks that he got because I thought, man, he didn't get to show what makes him good in the NFL. I guess. Yeah, I hope that he gets a, 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 some better looks. I do think Wiley, though, with the the versatility that he has. Yeah. Um, I think and the relationship is... to Cliff, like Cliff knows him well, you know, and like yeah, like how they utilize him in uh in at sc like they do he's like in critical situations he's the guy we want you know and i think there's a, a reason for that you know and i think like uh there's obviously a, a good relationship there so yeah for sure and you see you talk about utilization also as a blocker um there's some two back sets where he's in and he's like sealing the back side um you know as a pass blocker like there, there's a lot there and as a third back you know, do you want someone who's a little bit more versatile that can do a little bit of everything? I think that's, you know, the questions that or one of the questions that um, Adam Peters is ultimately going to decide as he puts his final stamp 
on this 53. Um, receiver position, uh, we talked about Diami. Um, I thought it was interesting how much Jahan Dotson played. Yeah. Like for a dude who's a second or a first round pick a couple years ago and, you know, is, is supposedly solidly wide receiver too. The fact that they had him out there, I mean, I think, actually, I have it up in front of me uh, from PFF. He played the fifth most snaps of anybody in this game. <clears throat> yeah. For and Washington. That's, I don't know what to make of it. It's interesting. The thing that keeps coming up with him is I love him as a route runner. I love his feel for catching the football is his play strength shows up more than I would like it to. You know, like when you're watching uh, Terry, when you're watching OZ, when you're watching even Jamison Crowder, like there's a strength to them that allows them to play through contact. And I just looked at that. I just actually watched it before we got on the call. The the fade in the second quarter going into the red zone where he beats the guy, but he gets a little bit of a bump and then loses his footing and falls down. And that's, I think, the stuff. If I'm a coach, I want to see him play through that and the only way I get to see it is if he's getting reps you know and so I think like that's something coming out of the game I think just going through it Terry didn't play obviously I think OZ looked great on the slant that he had uh, where it got brought back with the Cole Turner penalty again the play strength the patience fighting through the strong hands yeah, love that nice I think Bryce turned too yeah, great punt return. Bryson Tremaine, I thought, did a great job. He had that one hitch that was a little out. He was on not on the same page with Sam Hartman, expecting a back shoulder overthrow, but the catch over the middle, you see his size. Luke McCaffrey, the he runs routes like an NFL receiver. Like like when I watch him, there's something about the strength, the dexterity, the confidence into the cut. Love to see that. Um, I thought Rosemary Jack Saint was a little bit like kind of feeling his way. Which again, it's his first game as a, as a as a rookie, so I think he's got to adjust to the speed a little bit. But um, lots of positive things to draw from those other guys, and I think Jahan did some good stuff. I think he had a screen where he was a little bit creative, but I, I need to I, I need to see him play stronger, and it's something that is going to always kind of because again, I, I love the route runner, I love the nuance, I love how he layers stems and tells and indicators. He catches the football well, but he's always going to be limited. In, if he can't kind of get through this. And um, and I, I think like maybe that's why he plays a lot is because you want to see him kind of fight through some stuff. And I also think he's playing multiple positions. He's playing inside and outside, you know, like, and yeah. so you're going to play more because you're maybe the number, what is he, the number one F, right, or the slot receiver. And then when the outside guys go out, you become the number one outside guy. So maybe that's another reason why. But that's one thing that I think with the receiver specifically that I was like – would like to see a little bit more there from him. But again, not a bad day, just a personal preference thing more. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, one thing that I did notice with the receivers too, though, like Cliff's ability to get the ball to everybody. You know, you just instantly see why dudes love playing for him. Is like, John's got a screen. Terry's got a screen. Like, OZ's mm -hmm. got looks. Like, every single receiver, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember the target for him. The ability to, to, to get the ball to a bunch of different dudes, I, I think you see – um, in a major way. And I'm glad you, I mean, not that you wouldn't mention Bryson Tremaine, like you're the leader of the Bryson Tremaine fan, um, fan club, but you yep. see that he's different than everybody else because yeah. of that size on that one play. And you're like, I think that that's why, um, you know, right before I left, I had um, the receivers coach, Bobby Ingram on the show. Oh, and I was like, I, I know you're not going to, I know there's a long way to go, but like, I feel like Bryson is, you know, on a route to make the team. He's like, yeah, he's playing great. He, he works really hard. Like we just love him. You know, obviously, like you said, a long, he was very, very quick to be like, there's a long way to go. Like, do not, yeah. you're not going to pin me down here. And I wasn't trying to, but like, you're not gonna pin me down saying like, oh yeah, Bryson Tremaine's making the team. Cause obviously it's not even Bobby's call. Yeah. Um, but you know, you, you see the difference of him and everybody else in that room. Um, and we'll see if that continues to, to show up. All right. Anything else offensively before we uh, talk about a couple big defensive things real quick? Yeah, you know, two things. Sorry, because I can never just do one. Is Kaz Allen? Uh, shout him out. Oh, did yeah. a good job. Yeah, uh, catching. The Although I, I will say, you know, he had the 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 end around and like showed the ability after the ball. Uh, but the last play of the game with one second left to not catch the, that one, you're like, oh Come on, guy. yeah. I was taking my headset off, so I missed it. <laughs> so, to be perfectly candid, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I thought you see some of his creativity. And the other thing is the tight ends. I mean, I think that group looked great. Physical Benson, Benson, it. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I was super impressed with him. I, and it's something because he hasn't really showed up in camp. You know, like he's been a little bit quiet catching the football, not a great, you know, in terms of like individual man to man separation, but you see him on the seam, you see him on the out, you see his lower body strength to like break tackles and balance through stuff. And also you see his just desire to be physical. And it's just like, 
when him and Bates are on the field together, that's a nasty tandem. And then I think Cole Turner, I know he got two penalties, but I, I love how he's playing ball right now. I agree. He's, he's playing physical in line. Like even the second one, that PI, the guy's standing there at 10. I'm telling him, fight through that contact. Like, we're, like demand your space. That that's a bad play by that DB. I think it's such a bad play. It looks like PI. He does extend his arm a little bit, but it it was it didn't make him fall. He fell because he tried to like collision the receiver, and he's fighting for his space. I love that he hit the crack back even. Like that's just something that he hadn't shown as part of his game. So um, I love the physicality. I think that whole group did a good job. Colson Yankoff also deserves a shout out as a team's guy, and then in that kind of fullback move piece, he's just a good athlete and he's got the want to. So I think that group. Um, is different than it's looked the past couple of years, but you can see the the physical the physical mindset of the group, which is pretty exciting. For sure. Um, with Turner, it's like someone told him, like, dude, if you're not the hardest working guy out here, you're not making the team. And he's it like, does feel that okay. way, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and like the fact that he took that seriously, I don't know whether he's got the refinement in his skill set to ultimately overcome the numbers game and the fact that there's, you know, three guys ahead of him for sure in Bates, yeah. Ertz, and um and Senate. But it's not going to be for lack of trying. And, and at the very least, Cole Turner, at the end of the day, can rest his hat on that. And I'm sure Dan Quinn will tell him, like, hey, dude, great job. Um, no. And, you know, but it might be enough. Like, and, and if he's going to make plays in games, because, you know, he's been good in some practices and stuff before, and then just quiet in games or big drops, whatever. And, and he is playing his tail off. And it's something I noticed before I left in camp. And, and again, you know, the, that if you're going to get penalties for trying hard in preseason, like you said, and they're kind of wishy washy, then that's something you can look at. Defensively, I feel like the story of this game, Logan, the, the biggest talking point is going to be Emmanuel Forbes. He yeah. gives up the big touchdown, and I think this is just another Emmanuel Forbes type of day where he actually does a lot of really good stuff, but it's undone by the fact that he does the thing that you can't do in the NFL. It's Explosive plays are what make this league go right now. And if you are going to consistently give them up, like he has in camp to Terry McLaurin, you're like, ah, well, it's Terry. You know, he gives up uh, one or two uh, to Garrett Wilson in the joints. Um, and those are, you know, again, we weren't there to see the exact circumstances there, but we know on some level they happened. Uh, and then in the game, he gives up the touchdown to Jason Brownlee. And while he does make some nice plays that I know you want to talk about a little bit more underneath and in other circumstances, you can't keep undoing the good with the ultimate bad. And and that seems to unfortunately through a year and a training camp be the Emmanuel Forbes story in the NFL. Yeah. I'd say that's a, that's a really good characterization and I probably couldn't have said it better myself. And, and again, like he has a, a PBU early in the game where it's like straight man to man. He's isolated, runs foot to foot with the guy, doesn't lose his line, plays the football well. And you're like, dang, good job. He's a tackle on Bray, uh, What's his name? Braylon Allen, uh, you know, who's a big man. Like that dude in warmups, I was like, holy cow, you just are talking about built different, like built yeah. different. And, he, you know, he didn't get him down, but he's, he put his, his put, put his body on the line and, you know, got in on that leg and held on for dear life and made it happen. And he had another tackle, uh, on Braylon Allen later in the game, too. Like it was a, it was a penalty called back, but he's one on one, makes the play. So, like some of that stuff, like some of his run fits, I think generally pretty good in coverage. Not not perfect, but generally pretty good. And then, like you said, it's like that's good, but then you give up a touchdown, which was kind of weird to me. Like he kind of – I was standing right on the sideline when it happened. He's like playing the receiver well. He's in really good phase. And then all of a sudden he like looks back for the ball, and it's like, no, just like play through that guy a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's like he maybe expected back shoulder. I don't know, but it was – it was weird. I saw that happen a couple times in the game uh, with other DBs as well. I don't know if it's something they're talking through or coaching through or just different in the first time you get live action, but the technique didn't look right. I feel like when I see guys really play it well, instead of pushing away for space, they play into the body and look back and kind of rely on the feel of their shoulder to either widen the receiver or uh, stop them if he's trying to run a come like a like a stop like a, a fade stop. So. Um, yeah, and maybe that comes with experience. Maybe that comes with time. But I do think you bring up a great point. Like, underneath, he's been pretty good. Like, when he's playing Terry in practice, it's a war. If you're running a comeback, he's there. If you're running a hitch, he's there. In, there. Dig, good. And all of a sudden, on the fade, it's like, or the, or the go, it's like, I am I lose phase with the receiver. So that's one of the things I was so excited about. It's like, oh, first play of the game or whatever, the second play of the game, perfect phase. But... um yeah, so I think that's something definitely if you're a fan to keep an eye on. But I will say when you compare him to 
Mike Davis on the film. And Mike Davis is a good football player. But there is a distinct difference in the type of athlete you're talking about and dealing with. And I think like that's something that's always that I'm as a as a coach, I'm gonna really try to push him. Really try to push him to get better and really kind of buy into what we're doing. Because again, athletically he just is is special. There's a reason he's a is a top twenty pick in last year's draft. So For sure. I, I guess I despite the positive elements of what he did, the again, the explode even in practice, it's the same thing. You're like, man, great job, great PBU. Oh, look at that fit, good job. And all of a sudden, there's like huge explosive for a touchdown. And like we've talked about this before, like the NFL now offense is built on explosive plays. And so if you can you can give up the underneath stuff, but you cannot give up an explosive. And a right. touchdown in the red zone is an explosive play, big time. So yeah, for sure, it's kind of you know in some ways it's similar to like Andrew Wiley in the season he had last year. Where would be like, man, Andrew Wiley played a lot better than everyone realized, but he gave up a sack or a big pressure yes, that caused a yeah. huge incompletion or whatever. And it's like, okay, but when it gets to the biggest moment, why is the worst possible outcome happening? Yeah. And that's eliminating worst possible outcomes and mitigating mistakes to like, okay, well, he gave up a 10-yard comeback versus he gave up a go ball. Those are things that win and lose you football games. And mm. I'm curious to see with more time on task. Because like... As, as long as training camp, I mean, I just took a 10 day vacation and we're still early in training camp. We still got two more preseason games. Like there's still two more weeks of practice. Yeah. There's all this stuff, right? I just missed 10 days and we're still basically at the halfway point. Like there, there is just so much more time to go. And I think, you know, the, the phrase time on task, like we're starting to get into a critical mass of time on task where these guys have had new coaching, new techniques throughout the spring, throughout the, the fall, where hopefully it can start to click on a different level. You've now done it against another team, which is another right. kind of like data point in your head to be like, okay, now I might understand it differently. And so how does Forbes specifically for the context of this conversation, but also everyone else on the team, take to these things, study the film, do the work. And I think now is kind of the biggest, like now we're starting to really transition from teaching to evaluation from like, mm. okay, We've given you the tools. What can you show us in the next couple of weeks to earn your roster spot, your starting spot, your snaps, how, whatever, wherever you are in the hierarchy? And for Forbes, it's it's a starting spot. Um, but also maybe, you know, d do they open up trade calls or something like that if someone comes calling? These are the, the questions that are just happening this time of year. Yeah, and I think the other thing is like, you know, people are like, well, why aren't people talking about St. Juice like this? I think St. Juice, when you watch, just when you go out to practice, watch individual. St. Juice is like locked in. Mike Sanders still is like locked in. And Mike Davis, locked in. And when you when Forbes comes up, again, you see the athletic, but it's not exactly like the other guys do it. And so part of me is wondering is if, like, how is he buying in to the techniques? You know, mm. like, that's, that's something that I, again... The, the fact that it comes up consistently with him, I'm like, are you, are you locked in on this or like how, like what's going on? So, and it's something and again, not to defend like Rivera and that crew, because we know the coaching was not at the level that it is now, but like that is something that came up with him a lot last right. year. Yeah. It's a great point. And so that's something that I'm kind of like keeping an eye on a little bit is like, yeah. is it again, if he's, if he's not taking what you're teaching him seriously, then I, I'll never get you where I want you to go as a coach. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that when I played in the league, right? And guys, like, I don't care how talented you are. If you're not going to fit with us, especially if you're Adam Peters, like, I remember when I was in San Francisco, and this is something that's always looming in the back of my mind, is he traded, I want to say, like, four or five kind of, like, cornerstone pieces there. Not him personally, but Kyle and John Lynch and the whole staff because they're like, it's never going to fit with what we want. And right. is is that how Forbes is? I don't know. Again, like, like I just said, I thought... I'll be honest, man. Like, yeah. when we were having the conversation about Dotson, I had the same same thought. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's just, someone, are, are you and, and, competitive and tough? Right. Are you competitive? Are you tough? Can you do the things that we want you to do? Um, and ultimately like those guys are so talented that they might actually be able to answer the question. Yes. Somewhere else, somewhere else yeah. might want something different. So it's not really about what they are as football players, as NFL football players It's about what they are as commanders. And if there's yeah. more value for Adam to trade them, and for another team to give something up that is more valuable to Washington, hopefully like a second round pick or something like that, then, and considering where these guys are on their contracts, especially Forbes, like that is not an unreasonable ask. Um, 
you know, I think those are conversations that they would they would certainly take seriously. But that's not that's not us reporting anything. That's just kind no. of us speculating based off what we've seen so far, which is which probably is irresponsible. What, but yeah, we're, we are. Speculating. Well, but if we clarify, that's what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> you know. So so there's that. Um, and by the way, for whatever it's worth, PFF uh, graded out like he had a green grade across the board. Yeah. Um, he had a 71.4 overall. Um, 67, four in run 76, nine tackle and 69, three in coverage. So like he graded out pretty well, but again, the, you know, they graded individual plays and like that one play is bringing his grade yeah. way down, but re in the, in the context of a football game, not every game or not every play is, uh, graded yeah. out equally. I got a funny story about that. I, not a funny, it's like kind of one of those things that stings you when you remember it. But, um, I was playing a game and I actually played really well against the giants in 2000. 13 like physical in the run game good in pass pro ran good routes but i had a fumble and i remember like my grade was really high but i remember my coach was like you understand better than anybody that not all plays are created equal so like is this indicative of the of how you played no and i remember being like damn like you know what i mean like <laughs> that sucks yeah but, like, but great, i get the fumble that screwed us over or whatever yeah you know, and so you're like fumble was, yeah. but yeah yeah, no, but because it was in it was a t it was in a two minute situation or like like three fifty left in the half and they went and it was in like the it was like the forty five minus forty five and they went down and scored and I was like oh my god you know so but like that's that's the whole point of this conversation is like you can do a bunch of good stuff but if you've got that one thing that screws you then it's not good so. Yeah, and in, in radio context, it was a great show except for that f bomb I dropped that got me fired. Correct. Uh, yeah. I've never done that. Not yet. Anyway, I'm jet lag today. Knock on Knock wood. On wood. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jamin Davis, the last guy we want to talk about real quick. Um, and, and maybe on Thursday's show, we can talk a little bit more about some of the the kind of leftovers that we didn't get to, uh, guys that we should talk about, good and bad, uh, from this game. But uh, for, for today to wrap up, um, Jamin, I don't know. I can't help but think as I watch him, I'm like, I don't know. That guy seems good at chasing down the ball carrier and tackling him. Seems like a linebacker. Um, he sets an edge okay at times, even good at times. He has not been impactful at all as a pass rusher. And, and I really did try to focus in on him as I rewatched the game back this morning before we taped this podcast. Um, but I, I just don't really fully, like I get from a trait standpoint, the experiment, they keep saying they're going to play him more at linebacker and they're comfortable with him there. Then they never do it. And he's playing <laughs> defensive end. And his best thing is running and chasing ball carriers at like he's a linebacker. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's see. Like, I think he did a good job early on setting the edge against Olu Fushana. Yeah. You know, that's a yeah. big-time draft pick there. Um, and he set the edge in a way that I thought this could be problematic later in the game. Like, he set kind of a vertical edge. Like, he set, like, through the middle of the of the offender, right? So, usually when you're doing that, you want to get your hat and hands in there and then get your outside arm free so that if the ball does bounce, I can make the play. But he was kind of setting it the way they set edges last year, which is – through the middle, and then you're kind of playing inside, relying on that vertical knot back to force the ball carrier to cut back. So he did that. He made a play. Nice job. Tackled the running back. And then he pursued him. Uh, I think it was the next play. Made a tackle for loss. Like, great job. However, that vertical edge came bit him in the butt later, and the running back did bounce it outside and ran it for like 25 yards and tried to kill, try to absolutely murder Percy Butler. Kudos to Percy for not turning it down. Nice job. And then the next time is he gets a little bit nosy on an inside move on a pass rush when he can't do it. It's third and nine in the red zone. You can get the ball back here. You don't do it. The quarterback scrambles for a first down. And again, that all comes with inexperience at the position and getting a feel for stuff. I love the physicality, love the effort, but you can tell there's a ways to go. I think the thing that I came out is that he is a tremendous athlete, tremendous athlete. Yes. And it might work at the end. It might work, but it just seems like he's got a long way to go as a pass rusher, as a guy that can do that down in and down out. Now, I will say this. I trust I trust uh, Joe Wood Jr. In, in the sense that because of they use so many stunts, you know, like line stunts, like ETs, TTs, uh, internal games, big loops, very low skill as a actual pass rusher in those situations. You need to be fast and athletic. So that's where I think maybe in season when you're showing more of that stuff, that role becomes a little bit bigger, a little bit more dynamic. 
Yeah, one quote that I did catch on Twitter in the rare times I checked it was that Dan said Jamin has been better as like a first, second down player than they anticipated at edge, even if the pass rush stuff has been slow coming right. along. That he's actually like done a good job setting the edge and like playing with good discipline. And, you know, we obviously on that third down situation late in the game, it's the play that leads into the two minute warning um, that Logan was just talking about. And yeah, he gets dives inside and you're like, oh, great. There's 40 yards of space on the edge on third and <laughs> uh, nine, third and seven, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, not not great, Bob. Um, but the fact that Dan said that made me go, huh, well, maybe maybe he does wind up, you know, because I, I thought he was, you know, when I left, I was kind of like, he might get caught in the numbers game here. Like, I just don't see where he kind of fits on this roster. But the fact that they feel like they can trust him a little bit more, he is playing on teams and like he's in the picture a lot. He hasn't made a, a huge play yeah. on teams yet, but like he's, he seems to be in the right places. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to watch the next couple of weeks. I, I yeah. definitely think it's big. And if he can have that breakthrough moment, because again, we talk about time on task. He just doesn't have a lot of it. But if something clicks for him or they think that it's getting closer, then they'll continue to give him the shot because as time is, and this to me is like the big thing is like, John, John doesn't say stuff lightly. Um, so when John's talking about you don't give up on speed and you don't yeah. give up on athleticism and we're both watching this game. And, and like you just said, like he's a special, special athlete, like, you don't give up on that. And so I, I tend to think that he's probably going to wind up, they'll figure out a way to keep him around. And then it's, it's on Joe Witt, as you said, to figure out the best way to use him, And, and perhaps they have some things in mind that they don't necessarily want to show quite yet in the preseason. All yeah. Right, that or go. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Let's go ahead and wrap that up. And then yeah, we'll last thought the there is just that like, I think, I think he's, I think they, you know, some of the things we talked about with Forbes, like how there's the athlete, but there's maybe a lack of like buy-in. Mm. I think it's the total opposite with Jamin. And if there's one mm. thing that, your that you see is him bought in like he's excited at practice he's got a big smile on his face he's working hard and that means something to coaches because then i know hey maybe not now but week four you're there or six you're there and we can get you out there and you're going to elevate our elevate this defense and so i think maybe maybe that's what john is feeling because again he's big and he's fast right but i and i've seen big and fast guys get cut all the time but it's the fact that he is in it he wants it. He's excited about this opportunity. Um, and I think that shows up on those first couple of plays that he makes. Like he's working. He's setting edges. He's being yeah. physical. He's running stuff down. He's running to the football. So I think that to me is maybe the difference in, in, in how the coaches are talking about them, the, 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 the two maybe. players. Yeah. And I think specifically at that position too, man, like you have to be relentless. Like you have to understand that if you play 60 snaps, and you have three sacks, like you still didn't get one 57 snaps or like you might not make a play 57. Like that is percentage wise demoralizing. And it, that's why it sucks to be an offensive lineman, because if you have the inverse and you play perfect 57 snaps and then give up three sacks, like you had a bad game, even if the percentages are, are not fair at all. And so there's a relentlessness of like, yep, lost that rep. Yep. Lost rep. that rep. Didn't get what I needed. Let me go out again that Jamin Davis absolutely is playing with. And I think it's really impressive. Um, and we'll see again if, if, you know, that that's not enough to make the team, but it certainly helps push things in the right direction because of what you just said about what it could mean in the long term. All right, uh, that's our show for today. Uh, we'll be back with more practice recap and, and some leftover thoughts from the game later on in the week. Joint practice against Miami on Thursday. Game coming up, so we'll, we'll continue to give you two podcasts a week and then uh, recap the game uh, on throughout the preseason. So that's that's what we're doing. I made it, Logan. We did it. I think I'm going to go take a nap now. Good idea. All right. Then I'll see you all on the radio later. Goodbye. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>